coming up on this month's show. We sort the good from the bad with tripods, we look at how to master traffic trails, preview the UK's biggest photography exhibition, and we give away more prospect gear. It's all coming up, so make yourself comfortable and get ready for a 45-minute photography feast. Welcome to our March edition of Photography Online. If you missed our first couple of shows, check them out on our channel and don't forget to hit subscribe. Now every month we bring you a photography quote and this month it is from legendary photojournalist Burke Uzzel who once said, photography is a love affair with life. Which is apt considering we're coming to you this month from Venice, which is also known as the city of romance. One of our experts, Marcus McAdam, lived here once upon a time, so we're going to be joining him on this month's On Location as he leads a group of photographers around this amazing city. Photographing in Venice can be both rewarding and demanding. Being one of, if not the most photographed cities in the world, it's not easy to come up with something original, as everything has been done before, many times. I lived here in Venice for six months, so I know the city extremely well, but more importantly, I know it photographically, and it's knowing where to go at what time of day and in what conditions that really pays off. On the one hand, there are potential shots to be had everywhere you look, but the challenge, and often frustration, is getting shots which are clean of unwanted distractions. Being a city which survives on tourism, finding wide scenes free of people is not straightforward. You can either accept that you're going to get lots of people in your shots and use this to your advantage, or you can plan to avoid the crowds by either venturing to quieter areas or visiting the more popular ones at less popular times. Another option is to use a strong neutral density filter, which we explained in January's show, to blur any moving people. Here's a shot of a busy street scene, which would be impossible to get free of people. But by using a 10-stop ND filter, this has resulted in an 80-second exposure, which has blurred any moving subjects. The longer the exposure, the emptier a busy street or square will appear. My favourite time to visit Venice is the end of November, beginning of December. The weather's attractive, there's not many people around and it's great for photography. Venice is an ancient city which is falling apart, so it's no surprise that it's in a constant state of repair. The frustration comes with finding what would be a perfect composition if it weren't for a key area being covered in scaffolding. To give you some idea of how endless the construction here is in Venice, Piazza San Marco hasn't been free of scaffolds since the 1980s. An event which occurs occasionally in Venice, and one that lends itself to photography, is Aqua Alta. A few times each month, but more so in the winter, much of the island falls below the high tide level, which causes some of the lower-lying streets and piazzas to flood. Another advantage of having lived in Venice is knowing where the best pizza is. This place is... Uh, no, I'm going to keep this one to myself. One of the places I always visit when running a photography workshop in Venice is the nearby island of Burano. Its colourful houses make the perfect subject for both wider scenes and more abstract ones. Burano is only a small island, so you can see everything in just a couple of hours, but you'll want to return to key locations you discover to take advantage of the constantly changing light. Burano is the perfect place to tap into your creative side and look beyond the obvious. If you want to avoid the crowds, visit early in the morning or stay until dusk when most of the day visitors are back in Venice. Venice is also a great city to walk around and photograph at night time. 
The key to successful images, however, is to shoot during twilight, when it's dark enough to get that evening atmosphere of the artificial lights, but before the ambient light turns the sky totally black. Look at these three examples taken just 30 minutes apart. This one is taken too early before the evening atmosphere has taken hold. This one taken just a short while later now has the ambient and artificial light perfectly balanced. Still putting some colour into the sky and crucially to fill in any shadow areas such as rooftops to reveal the skyline. In this final example taken too late you can see that we have way too many deep shadows with no detail in the sky or in the roof lines of the buildings. The best time to visit is November and December. Avoid May to September when it will be too hot and too crowded. Also avoid Carnivale in February or March, unless of course you want to take portraits of masked revellers. My tip for getting around is to walk everywhere, rather than jump on and off the Vaporetto water buses, unless of course you want to explore other islands. And my final tip, try the freshly made tiramisu at Tre Macante, not far from Piazza San Marco. A few days in Venice is enough to get under its skin and bag a few decent shots. But if you have more time to spare, the picturesque town of Chioggia is just down the coast and the mighty Dolomites are just a couple of hours drive north. Oh, this is the life. You know, winter really is the best time of the year to visit Venice. You get to dodge most of the crowds and when the Christmas lights come on, it really is the most wonderful time of the year. Now you'll have noticed in that clip that most of the customers were using tripods and a good tripod really is an essential piece of kit for both amateurs and pros alike. Two of our experts, Marcus and Nick, are here to tell us more. Now it's come to our attention that it's very difficult to do a feature about tripods without inadvertently mentioning sexual innuendos or as the French would say, double entendre. So we're just going to dive straight in at the deep end. We're not going to be silly about it. It's going to be very professional, no sniggering. Um, but if you do hear any euphemisms, please just ignore them. No one's keeping count. Okay. So we've got a wide range of tripods to talk you through the pros and cons of different designs. But before we do that, um, one thing that's very apparent is that lots of photographers, they underestimate the importance of a good tripod and they think it's an area where they can save lots of money. Yeah, so the worst one is probably the plastic tripod here, um, plastic leg sections. And because of the plastic, they require this brace, which is, sits on the, the centre column here. Now, even with the brace, which is, supposedly makes it sturdier, it's actually still really flexible. So it's not really the best option. Yeah, so what you want really is something more like this. And there is no center column here, but if we look at this one here, this still has a center column, um, but there's no braces between the legs and the center column. So what that does is it allows you to spread your legs really wide. So what we're saying is if you've got a tripod with the braces like that, then it's probably best to chuck that away and just buy a new tripod. There's two basic materials that you should be looking for. Uh, one's alloy um, and the other one's carbon fibre. The main difference between the two is the weight. Um, they're pretty evenly matched when it comes to rigidity, um, but this one here is a lot heavier than this one here. So this is my travel tripod here. As, as you can see, it doesn't have a centre column. However, it did come with one. Like a lot of tripods these days, they do come with centre columns. Um, I've taken out all of my tripods to get rid of the centre column. So we have this one here, which has a nice length centre column, which a lot of people might like. However, when you want to go down, spread the legs. As you can see, I want to go low to the ground. You can't go down. Do you mind holding your centre column there? Thank you. Um, right, so with this one here, um, no centre column and then obviously we can spread the legs nice and wide and then you can get the camera pretty much on the floor so it's good for getting down low. So you're probably wondering well why do you have a centre column on a tripod if we've just told you that they're all bad. Um, the only use really is to get you extra length so if you've got your tripod set to maximum height already and you want to raise the camera further still then you can pull the centre column up like this but what you end up with is essentially a monopod on top of a tripod. There's too much balancing going on and that's never ever going to be stable. If you look at these two tripods here, 
they're pretty much identical in terms that they're the same height and they're full, both fully extended. But this one only has three leg sections, one, two, three. This one here has four leg sections, one, two, three, four. So the advantage with having more leg sections is that if I collapse both of these uh, tripods, even though they're the same height when they're extended, this one you can see will only be about that tall. So that's good for fitting in a suitcase. Um, this one here is gonna be about that long there. So the less leg sections you have, the less compact the tri or tripod is when it's uh, collapsed. Um, the disadvantage with having lots of different leg sections is it takes longer to set up because you've got to sit there and you've got to unscrew each one and then tighten each one. So if you've got five leg sections, that's gonna be four twist grips per leg three legs, four times three is 12. Uh, this one here, we've only got two uh, twist grips per leg. So we've only got six. So it would take double the amount of time to set up a tripod with five leg sections as it would one with three leg sections. These are pretty standard and they're rubber. Now the problem with rubber is that this tripod, doesn't matter how sturdy it is, is only ever as solid as the ground that it's sitting on. So we're on grass here, soft mud. So if you look at the amount of movement that I can put through that tripod there, there's a lot. So if it was windy, that would be wobbling all over the place. There's nothing we can do to increase the stability of that tripod because of the floor of the feet. So Nick's now going to demonstrate the other option. Yep, so this is my, other, my regular tripod here and it has three inch spikes on the bottom. So it's ideal for this surface. Um, so basically when I've got the tripod set up in the position, then I can then put it all the way into the ground and that's pretty damn stable. Yep, so now you can see that that is, I'm trying to wobble that, that's firmly fixed to the ground, it's not going anywhere. So if it was windy now, that would be a lot more stable and it's just purely because of the spikes. So that brings us on to the importance of a good head. Uh, so we've got, for instance, a ball and socket head a uh, pan and tilt head, and then there's a gimbal head, which we'll show you later. This head here, which is a, a, a pan and, and tilt head, you can see that we've got three different knobs, and this one here uh, adjusts the camera left and right, so that's the pan. This one here adjusts the tilt left and right, and this one here allows it to pan forwards and backwards. As you can see, it took me quite a long time to do all of that, and it's quite cumbersome. Uh, this is a ball and socket head. This one has a grip on it as well, just makes it a little bit easier. It's essentially the same as traditional ball and socket, um, but if you look, Nick's having to use two hands because you have to steady it with one hand while you release the tension. Um, and if you let go now, then the camera would fall. So this is the third type of head, it's a gimbal head. Um, it's used primarily with longer focal length lenses like this one. And as you can see, the camera hangs inside the head rather than sits on top of it. And that's important because you can balance the camera and then move it in both the up and down and left and right axis. And then when you let go, it just stays exactly where you've let go of it. So this is used primarily for sports and wildlife photography where you need to keep moving the camera because your subject's moving, but then your subject might stay still for a while and you don't want to have to hold a big heavy lens. So you just let go and it will stay exactly where you left it. So this is my main tripod here. Um, it's as sturdy as anything you're ever going to likely to want. Um, this is going to set you back between 450 and 500 pounds, not including the head. Um, Harry's one here is slightly cheaper just because it's slightly smaller. So if you look at the, the girth there um, compared to there, it's a slightly thinner tube. So it just makes it slightly less in materials. Uh, this is about 400, not including the head. What about your one over there? Uh, yeah, my one was about, if I remember rightly, £370, excluding the head. Um, the head, I don't really know if you want to know how much that costs, because I know Go you on. don't like this. It's about four or £500, but so I you, really like on, it. So you spent more on the head than you got on the legs? Yes. All right, okay. That says it all. <laughs> right, um, the cheapest I would say that you need to spend to get a decent tripod head is probably £250 to £300. But the difference between a £100 tripod and a £200 tripod is going to be huge difference between 200 and 500 is going to be significant. Beyond that, it's probably yeah. not going to be much at all. I reckon we did all right there, you know. I think, yeah. I, think I mentioned one innuendo at one point, but I don't think anyone noticed. Yeah, yeah. So we managed to keep it professional, which is the main thing. 
Aye, not quite, lads. We're actually going to be giving away a top spec tripod at the end of the show, so to find out what you might need to do to be in with the chance of winning that, just hang around. Now, moving on and looking ahead, every spring the photography show takes place in Birmingham. It's the biggest show of its kind in the UK. We're going to be there this year. If you've never been, here's a chance to see what you can look forward to. Welcome to The Photography Show. The Photography Show is the biggest event of its kind in the United Kingdom. Enthusiasts and professionals from all over the nation descend for four days on the National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham. There's something for everyone, from bargain hunters after those hard to find treasures to those fantasy purchases as well as some more boutique brands. Of course, the most well-known names in the industry also have a presence at the show. I caught up with Paul Reynolds of Sigma Imaging UK, who are, of course, well-known for their superb range of lenses. How many years have you been coming along, Paul? We've been coming to the photography show since it started. Wow. So a few years now. And what is it about perhaps the UK photography show um, that you particularly enjoy? Perhaps I'm sure Sigma also go to some of the bigger shows, maybe Photokina over in Germany. We do, yeah. In the UK, we're, we're responsible for the UK market and the photography show is easily the biggest biggest it's camera show be to be at. The quality of the consumers, I think, is, is the best thing. We've got four days and each day is as busy as the previous one. Sure. People looking to come and try the equipment out. We've got a big stand. Everything we sell is on on display and available for people to touch and try and, hands and on with get things. the hands on exactly. Sure, try the, yeah. try the yeah. equipment out. So here you can go from the extreme of a, an eight mm fisheye lens all the way up to an eight hundred mm telephoto and everything in between. And do you find you get people coming along who've maybe got um, a, a Canon kit or a Nikon kit and they maybe just want to try out Sigma? Yeah, it's looking at competitors' products. So sure. if they're a, a traditional Canon user and they've heard great things about a Sigma product which is equivalent to what they're, they're used to, they can come and try it out and compare the two. And obviously you've got, you've got a, a big stand here, you've got a big team with you, are you planning to expand it or do you expand over the years? Or This sort of size is about right I think for us. Sure. Um, it's a good space, it's a very clean stand, we, it serves the purpose and sure. that purpose is to be able to get the kit into people's hands and offer advice. Well thank you so much, it's been Pleasure. very nice to you. you and Thanks best of luck with, um, with everything on the show. Thank you. There's so much to see and do at the show. Learn new skills at one of the many master classes. Try out gear you could only dream of owning. There are tripods for every possible scenario. From these really wee ones to this thing. And drones to suit any budget. From this to this and pretty much anything you could possibly need. From gadgets to help you look beautiful, to practical clothing to keep you warm when you're out on the hills. You could even save on gym membership by buying gear like this. And when you've seen all there is to see, why not come to the True Viv stand for a superb back massage? And then get your energy levels back up before you head out and see more. Filter Manufacturers Case UK, favourite of our experts here at Photography Online, were one of the exhibitors this year. I couldn't pass up a chance to catch up with Andy Campbell-Jones. The great thing about the UK show is you get to do two things at, at the Foot Show UK. You get to get your hands on with the products, so you can see what every company offers, sure, yeah. but you also you can buy at the UK show. So a lot of like trade shows, yes. they don't sell. So yes. Photokina, you can't buy any items there. Okay. So, and it's it's more orientated at people who want to go and keep up, like the magazines, publicity, that sort of stuff. Sure. Whereas this one is aimed at the public. You've obviously been coming along for a number of years. Um, this is only our second oh, year at the show year. as displaying as case. Mm -hmm. um, so last year we basically introduced ourselves to the UK market. Mm -hmm. We've been in the UK, I'd say about oh, two and a half years now. Okay. And we're slowly building our brand up. And yeah. the photography show, obviously, you have to be there. If you're into photography and you're supplying something for photography, sure. you just have to be at the show. Yeah, yeah. And uh, besides obviously being able to come along to the stand, touch things, try things out, and get advice, yeah. um, is there anything else that you're doing this year or planning doing perhaps? And I know there's a lot of so master classes, things we, like we that. We want to get our products into the hands of people so they can see it. Mm -hmm. So one of the, there's two ways we do this. One is we make sure we 
we partner with a lot of well-known photographers in the UK. Sure. So we make sure they've got our product, mm -hmm. they understand the brand. They've got to be on board with us first. They've got to like what they, they, they're they handling. Sure. And once they do that, then we know that they run their own workshops and they will show it to their clients, mm -hmm. etc. And then we're doing um, sponsored um, workshops in a set, in a, in a way. So basically we'll say to some of our, our ambassadors or our, our, our supporters, our pro partners, we'll say, right, do you want to run a workshop in your area? Yes. Case will come along as well, we'll support you with that, then we'll give you the sample kits, etc. and you can do demo days. Okay. Yeah, and that's another way that so the, the, the guys out there that want to get a hands-on sure. with our product sure. can do it. Sure, sure. Well, that's fantastic, and uh, I hope it's a very successful show for you. Yeah, well, this year we've uh, far exceeded what we want to. Next year, expect to see us bigger and better again. The Photography Show returns for a seventh year in 2020 between Saturday the 14th and Tuesday the 17th of March. Harry will be bringing these legs back to the NEC, so why not come and see them in the flesh, if you dare. It really is such good fun. We're actually going to be coming to you from the Photography Show next month, so if you're there, do pop along and say hello. Now, continuing on with our top 10 location series, we visited number 10 at Loch Fada, number 9 at Rahunish. Let's join Harry and see what's at number 8. Number 8 on our top 10 list of views on Sky is Skur Avati Arudi. My sincere apologies to the Gaelic speaking community for my pronunciation. It's more commonly known as Hill of the Red Fox. If the name sounds familiar, it inspired the well known novel of the same name by Alan Campbell MacLean. The Hill of the Red Fox is one of the major peaks along the Trotinus Ridge, and along with the more popular Kerrang, is the only point along the ridge which you can access by road. Now when I use the term road, I use that pretty loosely. It quickly deteriorates, there's plenty of potholes, lumps and bumps. So you need a suitable vehicle to get you to the other end, otherwise you'll be walking the three mile round trip. There isn't much photographic potential until you're near the end of the track, as you're too far away from the ridge. The first point of interest is where you cross the stream at this small bridge. So it's only when you get this close that you get more of the imposing sense of this mountain. Now, the interest here is the river and how it looks like it's flowing directly from the mountain itself. This makes composition relatively straightforward. All we need to do is make sure we get nice and low bringing this right into the foreground and then having the river as a nice leading line up towards that epic ridge line. However, the main attraction of Hill of the Red Fox lies at the end of the track where my favourite viewpoints can be found. The ground underfoot can be very wet here, so a good pair of sturdy waterproof boots are thoroughly recommended in order to get to the best points. There are two locks here both left over from open mine pits from when diatomite was quarried here and taken by train to the coast. You can still make out the train line from the air. And a few remaining structures like this one hint at its industrial past, though it's hard to believe on a tranquil day like today. The best time to visit is on a calm morning when there's usually an epic reflection on the locks. The smaller of the two is quite sheltered, so even if there's a ripple on the larger lock, it's still worth checking out the smaller one, which is just out of sight, around the corner. This has got to be one of my favourite views on Sky. I mean, look at that. It's a bit of an injustice to call it a hill. It's a mountain. Now, it's all about the reflection here. Perfectly crystal clear. As the sun gets a little higher, Reaching down towards the bottom of the hill, it starts to illuminate a rather alien looking landscape, if you're standing in the right place of course. 
The way these tussocks of grass catch the light at an angle in the morning really reveals their form and shape. Walking further towards the hills will eventually lead you back to the stream where it runs down a steep bank. In the summer, flowering foxgloves make the perfect foreground with the mountain providing the drama in the distance. A true hidden gem, Hill of the Red Fox remains under most people's radar. Get here for dawn on any calm morning in the summer and you'll be duly rewarded for your effort. Finally, it's worth remembering that this area is quite remote and there's not much phone signal. So if you're gonna lock your keys in your car, best not to do it here. Just kidding. What a hidden gem. For more hidden gems, don't forget you can check out the Photographer's Guide to Sky, available at the link below. Now, with the night is still long, it's a great time to get out after dark with your camera and try things like long exposures and traffic trails. The Isle of Skye, where we're based, isn't well known for its big city lights and rush hour volume, so we decided to send Marcus a little bit further afield to demonstrate the technique. Welcome to Hong Kong. I've come to Asia's most vibrant city to do some nighttime photography, and in particular, traffic trails. Traffic trails are simply a way of blurring moving traffic with a long exposure. This can be done both during the day and at night, but the effect is far more dramatic at night when car lights paint the scene as they move across the frame. If you've never tried this before and want to give it a go, or if you've tried it before and haven't had much success, then I'll take you through it step by step. First of all, let's look at what equipment you'll need. Luckily, there isn't anything particularly expensive or specialist. It's all about good technique. And as in all areas of photography, the better the equipment, the more potential your photos will have. A good, sturdy tripod is the most important thing, as it is essential to have the camera perfectly still during the exposure. Using a cheap, flimsy tripod isn't going to get the results that you want, so don't try and save money when it comes to good camera support. Also, it's important to get a tripod which goes up high enough to get over barriers like this, if you have one of those travel tripods, which is really compact, but only goes up to that height, then it's not gonna do the job. When it comes to your camera, the only important criteria is that you can control it fully manually, as an auto or semi-auto setting, such as aperture priority, isn't going to achieve consistent results. There is no particular lens specification for shooting traffic trails. You can shoot with any focal length and at many apertures, so just use what you already have. Just make sure that any image stabilisation is turned off and that you are in manual focus. It's important to be able to take a photo without having to touch the camera, and a cable release will allow you to do this. Now that we are armed with the necessary equipment, we need to find a suitable scene and location. One thing to remember with traffic trails is that they are not a strong enough subject on their own. You need to find a scene which works well enough without them and then include them for extra impact. An obvious vantage point is from a footbridge over a busy road as this allows the traffic to pass below you and also elevates your viewpoint to allow you to see more of the traffic than if you were standing at street level. Now as with all nighttime city photography, the best time to shoot is actually at twilight when there's still a bit of ambient light present in the sky. What this does is it picks out any cloud detail that you might have, and even if it's totally overcast, you still get a nice blue tint to the sky. Lots of people turn up too late once it's completely dark. They think nighttime photography, I'll go out at night. But if you turn up when the sky is completely black, then the scene's already past its potential. The closer you are to the equator, the shorter the window of opportunity, as the sun sets at a sharper angle and therefore dips below the horizon faster. In the UK, there could be a 10 minute window as the ambient levels pass through the same exposure as the artificial light. But here in Hong Kong, this is reduced to less than two minutes. When it comes to composition, ideally you want to get your traffic trails to go diagonally through the frame, because these will then act as a leading line to pull the viewer's eye into the shot. 
If you can get those lines to find the corners of the frame, then even better. Now, let's discuss technique. This is the most important part, so listen carefully. Remember that you need to be in manual shooting mode. Once you've decided on your viewpoint and sorted out your composition, we need to get the exposure sorted out. But this is a little bit more complicated than usual, but nothing to worry about. Basically, you are trying to get two lighting scenarios, the ambient and the artificial, to balance together at the same exposure. The key to this is all about timing. All artificial light in our scene, such as car headlights, tail lights and street illumination, and floodlit buildings, are at a constant brightness. These areas won't get brighter or darker. The ambient light, however, will change drastically. All we need to do is expose for the artificial light, which is constant, so it's a fairly easy thing to do. And then we're waiting for the ambient light to fall to the same luminance so that they're both at the same exposure. If we shoot too early, then the ambient light is brighter. That's not a problem because we just have to wait and it will eventually fall to the same level. If we shoot too late, then the ambient light is going to be down here and it's never going to come up again until the following day, so we would have missed our chance. Now here's the clever part. We can alter the length of the traffic trails by changing the three controls which make up the exposure triangle. These are exposure time, aperture and ISO. If we change the aperture or the ISO, then we simply make the entire image darker or brighter, as you can see here. But if we change the exposure time, then as well as making the entire scene brighter or darker, we also change the length of the traffic trails. If we look at this example here, you can see that I've used an exposure time of one second. This hasn't allowed much time for the traffic to move through the scene. So what we need to do is extend the exposure time to say eight seconds, which is three stops. The problem we now have is that the image will be three stops too bright. We can bring it back to the correct exposure by reducing either the ISO or the aperture by the same amount. In this case, I reduced the aperture by three stops to f16. This has now kept the overall exposure exactly the same, but extended the length of the traffic trails because the camera's shutter was open for a longer period of time, which allowed any moving lights to travel further across the frame. For something different, you can experiment with shooting from a moving vehicle. Here I took a 1.3 second exposure from the top deck of a tram as it travelled through the brightly lit area of Causeway Bay. The tram in front was travelling at a similar speed, so this hasn't moved much during the exposure. So once you appreciate that traffic trails should only be used to add impact to an already interesting scene and that the ambient light levels have to match the artificial light levels, you'll be on the right path to creating some great traffic trail shots. Hong Kong is somewhere I've always wanted to visit, but we've actually been invited next year to have a wee look around one of the biggest tripod factories in the world. Hasn't been decided yet who's getting to go, but between you and me, I put my name in the hat four times, so fingers crossed. Now, dedicated colour cameras have been around since the 1950s, but every photography lover I know still loves a good black and white image. In this month's 60 second editing tips, Nick Hansen is showing us how to convert our colour images into mono. This month, I'm going to show you how to convert a colour image to a black and white image in Lightroom. Now surprisingly, the more colour you're able to capture makes this process easier. So I've selected this particular image because it has four strong individual colours. We've got the pinky purples of the flowers, blue window shutters, yellow wall and red door. The first thing we need to do here is to go to our basic panel and select black and white at the top here. Our image is now black and white and it's created a new panel down below called B&W where as you can see we have eight individual colours. Moving the red slider to the right makes any reds in the image brighter and to the left makes them darker. Conversely with blues, brighter and darker. You'll see the windows change there. And if we do the magenta one we'll see our flowers now change. And finally the wall of our image was yellow. So if we drag the yellow slider to the right it becomes pretty much solid white and if we drag it to the left it almost becomes solid black. So this gives us full control over for instance they have a really bright wall, really dark door and really dark windows or the opposite, really bright window, really bright door and really dark wall. Now we still have full control over things like contrast like we would in any other image but that's for another time. For now, my 60 seconds is up. Thanks, Nick. Why not dig out some images you think might convert well and give it a go? 
Now, from the streets to the mountains, it's not just outdoor enthusiasts that like to head into the high places of the world. Lots of landscape loving photographers love to head up the mountains in search of those epic shots. But if you are heading out, it's not just your photography kit you need to be thinking about. I met up with Heather Morning, Mountain Safety Advisor for Mountaineering Scotland, in the middle of the Cairngorms National Park to get her insight into being prepared when you're out in the hills. Well, I'm delighted to be uh, speaking to Heather Morning, Mountain Safety Advisor for Mountaineering Scotland. And we've just come up here to have a wee chat about, uh, obviously mountain safety is, is, is your, your area of expertise. Um, and as photographers, many photographers head up the hills all the time. There's, there's so many spectacular images and obviously we live in an absolutely stunning place. Mountains draw people from all over the world. Uh, is there any basic safety tips that are perhaps would just, are useful for absolutely everyone, doesn't matter how far perhaps they're going? Starting with the basics, I think people need to just be mindful that the weather they're experiencing down in the Glen is going to be very different up in the mountains. It would be very unusual for me to just go up carrying very little in the way of spare clothing. Yeah. Extra layers, definitely, and being prepared for it to change and perhaps, you know, for it to rain, for example, and having a waterproof top and bottoms. Uh, you mentioned the weather apps. I know there's loads of great apps out there with maps on them, Ordnance Survey. Mm -hmm. Is that sufficient? Can you go out with your phone and, you know, everything's on there or should you actually bring something physical out with you, a paper map, a compass? Is that a good idea? Well, that's a, a, a really uh, sort of hot potato <laughs> in the mountaineering world and, um, you know, in our age of modern technology, of course, we're all very sort of focused in on relying on electronic gadgets, mm -hmm. which are great, yeah. but I always think they should be used, or advise that they should be used in conjunction with some traditional map and compass yeah. skills, which are never going to let you down. Talk to me, if you can, around knowing your limitations and, you know, I know people want this shot, but obviously safety is paramount over everything else. Everybody who goes out in the hills for very different reasons can get very blinkered sometimes yeah. and we call it heuristics, it's how we kind of interact with each other and, and with the environment around us and if we're very focused on getting that particular shot and getting to that location, sometimes there can be really obvious things happening around us, for example torrential rain yes. or the daylight hours are, are kind of, you know, drawing in that, you know, common sense mm -hmm. would tell us that, hang on a minute, it would be a wise idea to turn around now I can always come back tomorrow next week um, you know the photo is always going to be there the, the important thing is that, that you are there too and if you have headed up there perhaps and you've gone beyond what really you should have done you've turned around you've come back uh, maybe the weather's changed maybe that burn you crossed you know four hours ago which was step across the bowl is now in spate or perhaps you do slip and you roll your ankle or something mm -hmm. what would you do then what are the steps do you, do you leave somebody and go and try and find help who do you call if you can so that's a, a really good question because however well prepared we all are occasionally you know things happen outside our control so i always carry um, a bivy bag which um, i've actually got one here in my rucksack these are probably a very uh, the, the cheapest bit of kit in the outdoor stores it's just like a five quid orange bivy bag like a big and bed liner. to put it into context i was on the kengon mountain rescue team for 17 years okay. and one of the first rescues i was out on was in winter a couple were out all night on the plateau because they had um, not been able to navigate off and when we found them the next day she was in a five quid bag he wasn't she was alive he was dead oh. It's a no-brainer. It weighs nothing, costs nothing, and yeah. you know you're carrying potentially a lot of heavy um, photography equipment. Why not have one of those in your exactly. bag as well? Sure. Yeah. And for your mobile phone to work in the hills, obviously you don't want to have used the battery up mm -hmm. by navigating with it or taking photographs with it, and you need line of sight to a transmitter for okay. it to work. But we have a system here in the UK where if you just have one bar of reception, mm -hmm. you can text to 999, and that would be you know help. Fred Bloggs, broken leg, okay. and you will be responded to by text, but you do need to have your phone registered for that service. So it's the SMS uh, emergency texting service. And you know, there's plenty of places still here in the Scottish Hills where you will not get any form of comms out from your phone. So your only option then, if you're on your own particularly, is to communicate through some form of satellite technology. Okay. So this is um, an example of a beacon mm -hmm. which operates via satellites. So all you need is a clear view of the sky. These are expensive. They're 
cost around about £200, but if you often go into remote locations on your own, then I think £200, something yeah, that well could potentially it. save your life. Uh, you mentioned the tech service and obviously the, the beacon there. Are there any websites or apps that you would recommend uh, people can go to and just get, get some more info? Yeah, so um, mountaineering.scot, which okay. is the national governing body for, for mountaineering mm -hmm. here in Scotland, and it's all very relevant for people going out into the hills doing any sort of activity. And on the mountain safety section, it has all the advice. It's got top tips on what to take, um, how to navigate, and certainly what to do in the event of an emergency and how to register your phone for the emergency service. Well, fantastic. Thank you so very much for, for chatting to us about all this, and uh, hopefully it makes everybody uh, a bit safer and a bit wiser before they head up the mountains for yeah. those spectacular shots. Lovely, thank you. Thank you. For more advice and information, check out your local mountaineering organisations online. Some really good advice there. Thank you so much, Heather and Roxy. And if you've got any tips or stories you'd like to add, feel free to leave them in the comments below. We're very excited this month to be giving away a tripod. You might remember earlier in the show, Nick and Marcus were talking all things tripods and we are giving away a King Joy carbon fiber tripod. This is top spec stuff. And I wish I had someone uh, to talk about it because this is actually the, um, the spec that our experts use. So, I mean, I don't know that much. Well, would you look at that, Marcus? As if by magic. As if by magic, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Good, Marcus, we're giving away a tripod this month. Now, I know you guys are King Joy uh, lovers. Yep. Why don't you talk through what we are giving away here? Okay, so this is the um, uh, travel tripod. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the one that I use myself when I go away, traveling. Um, good thing about it is it's very light. Center column's removable which makes it even lighter. Um, but what's pretty good about this one is one of the legs has a rubber grip. Um, that's the leg that if you twist it like this, actually unscrews. Um, and then you can fix the centre column to that. So then the head's on top of the centre okay. column. That then becomes a monopod or a walking stick. Um, so it's kind of like a walking stick, monopod, tripod, all in one. Um, so it's pretty useful. Um, and made from carbon fiber, so it's gonna last a lifetime if you look after it. Amazing. Um, and comes with a ball head as well. So um, yeah, for those of you who don't know uh, about King Joy, um, they make pretty much half the world's tripods. Mm -hmm. So um, they make tripods for pretty much all the brands around the world. Wow. So chances are that um, if you've got a tripod sitting in your cupboard somewhere, it was probably made in the same factory, but this is their own brand, which Fantastic. is their kind Only of high the spec. Brilliant. Now this retails for around... 325. 325 pounds. So you can win a tripod worth over 300 pounds. We'll give you a brand new one. We'll give this one. Marcus, I think, wants this one back uh, later on. But all you need to do, if you want to be in with a chat, follow the link in the description below. You just need to answer a simple question. By the 15th of March 2020, we'll be drawing a winner completely at random uh, and drawing that on next month's show. Marcus, thank you so much. Can I go now? You can go. Okay, I perfect. I was going to go this way. Yeah. See you later. Speaking of next month's show, our April edition is coming to you live from Birmingham, the National Exhibition Centre. Yes, it's the UK Photography Show. We'll be there, so do feel free to stop by and say hi. Until then, take good care, but most of all, take good photos.